Hello, ladies. How are you today? Can they hear Hi there. Me? Hello. Good morning. How are you? Good. Well. How are you, Linda? Joyful and grateful. Glad to be here. So we're going to get started and I'm going to I'm just going to turn it over to you ladies and let you get started with your presentation. I will monitor the chat room and if there's any questions, I will let you know. Sounds good. Well, I'll speak first and then I'll give it over to Kim. Okay. Um, I'm London Butterfield, neuropsychologist at St. Anthony's Hospital. So what I'm going to start with today is talking about neurodegenerative disease, cognitive disorders um, and get into some detail about that and then Kim will talk about brain wellness and caregiver support. Ask if they can, can see. you see our screen? We can see our, your, our we can't see your slides. You can't see the slides. Okay, we're gonna work on that. New share. There you go. You're up. It's working. It shows our slides. You got it ladies. Okay, perfect. Okay. So you can just hit the right arrow okay. if you want to go. Okay, you're uh, on live. Okay, got it. All right. So um, just, just to kind of do a little recap on what we're going to cover. Um, first, we'll talk about or neurocognitive disorders, um, differentiating what is major neurocognitive disorder? What is mild neurocognitive disorder? You may have heard the terms mild cognitive impairment and dementia um, more commonly used, uh, but we, we use those other terms a lot now. Uh, versus normal aging. And then how is that assessed? How is it diagnosed? How do you know if you or your loved one is experiencing decline that's normal age-related change uh, versus something that is abnormal? We'll talk a little bit about that. And then we'll talk about what could be causing that kind of decline because there are some reversible causes as well as, as many of you know, irreversible causes such as neurodegenerative disease. Um, and we'll talk about uh, four of those common progressive illnesses associated with that. Um, and then Kim will talk about support for care partners. And I know that um, everyone knows the importance of that. Um, and then brain wellness, what can we do early on in our lives to protect our brains, to, to provide a, a, a brain structure system of, of that's, that's buffered? From, from future decline. Um, and then what can we do um, even if there are memory decline and memory impairments already? Okay, what is neurocognitive disorder? That's the first place we're gonna begin. Um, neurocognitive disorder is diagnosed typically by a neuropsychologist or possibly in a neurology setting um, when there's a perceived decline Either you, you've noticed in your loved one that there's a change, or perhaps the person themselves has noticed that there's a change, or perhaps the doctor has raised concern about a change in thinking abilities. And I, I'll just pause real quick to say, what is cognition? Just to be clear, cognitive functions have to do with thinking abilities. So when we use the term cognition and cognitive functions, we're talking about various thinking skills. Most commonly people think of memory, but it really includes other things too, like your ability to multitask, to use what we call executive functioning, to have mental flexibility, uh, your language skills, your non-language, spatial skills. Can you navigate when you are driving as well as before? Are you getting lost? Things like that. So we look at that in the evaluation. And when we do an evaluation, we want to ask the question of, are the current cognitive abilities below normal for age? And that for age piece is extremely important because there's some normal change that happens with age. And a lot of people feel, well, I think my decline is normal for age. Um, and it can be hard to know whether that's the case or not unless there's some kind of objective evaluation that gives a quantitative score relative to others in your same age group. And that's what we do um, in a neuropsychology setting. And we want to know that this change is not due to something like delirium from something such as an infection, where it's clouding the person's thinking and they're having some metabolic changes in their body. We want to know that it's, it's not due to that. And also we want to know it's not due to mental illness. Perhaps the person is in a severely depressed state and that's what's causing this memory change. 
Um, so we have to consider these other factors. And before a diagnosis is given, we would rule out those things, ideally through the doctor, the primary care doctor, um, before getting a, an evaluation. Now this table shows a more of a visual of these things. So let's start with normal aging. Is there perceived cognitive decline? Yes or no. There may be, or some may say, no, I don't notice any change. Um, and so you could have some changes that are not considered abnormal for age and not considered a concern. Is there a cognitive deficit for age? No. If somebody tests in the normal range for age, even if they've noticed some changes in themselves, and there are some true changes, if it's normal for age, it's not considered a deficit. And is there a functional deficit? I know there's been a lot of talk about um, what are what does that mean? And um, IADLs is how we consider this, or looking at ADLs, activities of daily living that are either basic, toileting, maintaining hygiene, um, things of that sort, or that are more complex instrumental activities of daily living, like can you manage your medications by yourself now? Are you able to still manage your bills? Are you still able to go shopping and purchase items that you need from the store? Are you able to man maintain your appointment schedule? These are complex daily functioning items that we consider and that are actually really important in determining whether somebody has what we call mild cognitive impairment or mild neurocognitive disorder versus the label of dementia or major neurocognitive disorder. With mild neurocognitive disorder, there is a perceived decline as well um, as is there in dementia. Um, and there is a cognitive deficit observed on testing. So the deficit is not age related. It says, okay, well, there is a deficit and it's not due to age. It's due to something else and there's some abnormal change. Again, not due to delirium, not due to a mental health disorder. And there is no functional deficit. In other words, a person is still able to, in general, manage their functional, independent, complex daily tasks like medications, finances, appointments, and that sort of thing, even meal preparation and cooking. Now, in a, in a mild cognitive impairment phase, there may be increased effort or use of compensation strategies in order to accomplish these tasks as well as before, but you're able to, with some adjustments, um, do these tasks. You may need some reminders here and there, um, but for the most part, you're independent still in that. Now that's different from a major neurocognitive diagnosis in that aspect. Now there's a lot more help required and the person does need a family member or spouse or someone else to, to manage the medications or the finances because there have been too many mistakes for them to be really reliable on doing that on their own. So um, just to clarify in terms of diagnostically what these terms mean, um, now you should be pretty clear um, on the differences between those phases. And in a neurodegenerative disease process, there's a decline that moves steadily through those phases. There's normal age-related change that starts developing into a decline that's abnormal, could be considered MCI, mild cognitive impairment, or mild neurocognitive disorder before it goes into a more um, major neurocognitive disorder stage. And then once somebody does have that diagnosis of dementia, then you go through stages there. So you'll have mild dementia, moderate, severe. Um, so that gives us some clarity on, on terminology. The other thing I want to point out, this is a question that I get asked a lot, is what's the difference between um, dementia and Alzheimer's disease, someone might say. And so just to be clear, dementia is an umbrella term. That means there is a deficit that's abnormal for age and there's functional impairment. Um, and then all of those types of dementia are what we're talking about when we say Alzheimer's disease or vascular dementia or Lewy body dementia or frontotemporal dementia or Korsakoff syndrome or there's several others, Parkinson's disease, dementia and so forth. Um, but the most common are those ones on the screen right here. And they are caused by different things. So different protein pathology changes in the brain, 
Um, and there's, there's a, a different course for these things. The symptom profile will look a little different. The behaviors in the person that has Alzheimer's disease might look different from somebody that has frontotemporal dementia, uh, especially at the beginning phases of the disease process. And I will say they start to often look more similar to each other as those diseases advance. One reason why it's so important for a person that is experiencing some of these changes to see their doctor initially is because it's possible that changes are due to a reversible cause and you always want to rule that out. So up on the screen, there are some common reversible causes of cognitive decline. And so you want to double check that there is no infection or urinary tract infection, um, that there's not another metabolic explanation for the change. People that have a vitamin B12 deficiency or who have thyroid abnormalities or who have had some toxic exposure may have some behavior change or thinking changes that are reversible once those things are identified and treated. You might have a medication effect. Perhaps you're on a medication that's blocking the memory neurotransmitter, acetylcholine, um, and affecting memory. Or you may have a problem that's due to alcohol. And a lot of times people don't realize that the alcohol can affect your thinking in a very significant way. Um, in some people, they're less vulnerable. And in others, they're more vulnerable to the effects of alcohol on thinking. And that depends, too, on how much a person is drinking, of course, too. Um, but you can have an alcohol-related dementia as well. Um, and oftentimes that's not reversible, but sometimes it can be reversible if a person um, stops drinking alcohol or recognizes if the doctor can assess B1, which is thiamine, um, and they may see a deficiency there that could be replenished um, with treatment, and you may see some improvement. And then there are some other things here too, depression, normal pressure, hydrocephalus, uh, tumor, there may be something that a brain scan might need to pick up on. And that's why oftentimes if you see a neurologist early on for memory issues, they'll often order a brain scan like a CAT scan or an MRI just to rule out stroke or tumor or a brain injury of some kind. Um, autoimmune disease or uh, perineoplastic syndromes. Sometimes you might see that in a cancer. Um, where the uh, body is attacking cells it shouldn't be, and that results in some um, cognitive deficit there too, or other central nervous system infection, um, which can cause more of an acute decline. And so if you see a real acute change, you really want to go into the doctor real quickly um, to assess for anything that's, um, that can be reversible. Now, typically in a neurodegenerative disease process, you're not going to see an acute decline. You're going to see a gradual decline. And we call that insidious in onset. So it starts out little by little. Someone will say, you know, I first started noticing that there was something wrong uh, when dot, 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 or I didn't really notice that there was anything wrong, but looking back, now I realize there were some unusual behaviors um, and, and I didn't, they didn't stand out to me at first. So that's an example of this insidious onset and then a gradual decline that follows. And so this, I think, is a nice graphic because it shows that you're in a normal preclinical, we would call it, phase initially, even though there might be some disease process happening in the brain that's not identifiable yet, um, some pathology changing in the brain. And then a person develops some symptoms. Okay, I do notice that there's a perceived change here in this person. Their memory is not like it used to be, and um, they're still functioning okay, though. That's where you're in that MCI stage. And then over time, you develop into the dementia stage and a neurodegenerative disease process, um, particularly in something like Alzheimer's disease, frontotemporal dementia, uh, or like a, Louis, a dementia with Lewy bodies. Now with vascular, it's a little bit uh, more variable because vascular dementia depends a lot more on what's causing that vascular dementia. If it's from a stroke, uh, you might have some improvement actually with rehabilitation or stability, um, or if it's due to some gradual accumulation of white matter pathology, then you might have this slow gradual progression of decline. So just to, to touch on 
what this assessment looks like when you are getting an evaluation for cognition. If you have concern and you have, um, you've noticed that there's some changes in your loved one, oftentimes the first step, step is to tell your doctor. They evaluate some of these things that I've mentioned, lab work, to see if any there are there any abnormalities there in or vitamin deficiencies, um, thyroid abnormalities, and so forth. They may do a brain scan and they may send you for a neuropsychological evaluation to characterize your thinking skills and to uh, identify more specifically if this is age-related change or due to depression or due to something else. Um, and those patterns on the neuropsychological evaluation help me to guess what's happening within the brain itself based on your thinking pattern. And I, I, I'll just describe um, different disease processes show up in different patterns of strengths and weaknesses cognitively. And so that's how the neuropsychological evaluation is helpful for identifying an etiology and a cause um, or to at least rule out certain causes. A lot of times we end up where we, don't, we know it's not X, Y, or Z, but it could be A, B, or C. And so we go in a year later, in that time, we're ruling out these other, other these possible etiologies. Um, and it's helpful also to have a one, time point one and a time point two to see if things are changing over time. The primary goal of the evaluation really depends on the patient. Some people are here because they've had a brain injury, so they know what the cause is of their decline. There's not a question of, is this some process that I'm not sure of. They know what it was. I was in a car accident, you know, last year and I had a traumatic brain injury or I was in a coma for a period of time. Um, and now I can't think the same. And so I just want monitoring of, of where I'm at or the evaluation helps to guide rehabilitation efforts. Um, what are the strengths and what are the weaknesses that still need rehabilitation? Um, what can we target for improvement? Others that come for a neuropsych evaluation might be young children who are having trouble in school. And so the evaluation identifies, is there a learning disability here? Where can the school provide accommodations for the child to help them succeed academically? So there's a whole range of reasons that a person may see um, someone for this kind of evaluation. Um, but I'm talking, of course, more so today about those with that come for a neurodegenerative disease evaluation or some memory evaluation to see is this something serious or not serious that's going on. Um, one of the main goals, of course, is to identify cognitive strengths and weaknesses. And so on the right side of your screen, you'll see an image that shows some of the primary areas of cognition that we assess in an evaluation. Memory, and you know, when you go to a primary care or a neurology office, you may get a test that asks you to remember three words or five words even. Um, and so that is a screening. That is a, is a first look to see, is there any obvious change? And that's helpful to kind of guide the next step. But the memory testing that we do here is a whole lot more in depth. So we might have you try to remember 15 words or 16 words, um, it depends. Um, and there's a normal amount of error. Most people can't get all of them, um, but we assess that so we can get uh, more detail about the memory process and the learning process. Is the person having trouble paying attention during the first trial of the words? And we repeat those over and over so that we can ensure that you're getting the information in as best as possible. And then we may assess you later to see if you retained what you could and how much can you freely recall of what you learned 30 minutes ago. Um, and then we want to ask the next question, which is really important. If I try to jog that out of you, is it in there? So even though you couldn't come up with many words, if I ask you, was this on the list? Yes or no? Was this on the list? Yes or no? That answers the question of, is it just that I can't retrieve the information, but it's in storage? And that tells me about what brain regions are more likely involved. Um, and then we look at visual memory too. Can you remember pictures uh, that, that are nonverbal material? Um, and we look at um, attention and executive functioning. Executive function, again, like I said earlier, that has a lot to do with mental flexibility. Can I, can I shift from one gear to the next? Can I multitask? But it also has to do with your ability to look ahead in time. Can I plan ahead? Can I organize what's coming? 
Um, it also has to do with decision-making ability, judgment. Can I make a sound decision? So that's an ability that we consider really higher order or higher functioning. And then language, there's a lot of complexity to language, comprehending language, fluently producing speech, coming up with words, knowing what words mean, even if you can't come up with the word in that moment. And that also, the different performance on these different things can tell us about what brain regions might be affected um, and what brain regions are spared or not affected. And then spatial skills. Um, can you see what's in front of you? Can you identify faces? Um, can you navigate? Um, and I didn't mention just before um, the etiology. So when look in looking at these patterns and in a, uh, trying to figure out what brain regions are likely involved, that helps pinpoint etiology cause um, of the change. And that's what we're trying to do all, oftentimes. Now, there are several different kinds of processes that can cause a cognitive disorder and a cognitive decline. Um, the most common neurodegenerative disease, as many of you know, is Alzheimer's disease. It's present in about, it's in many people, it's a, it can, or, uh, comprises 60 to 80% of dementia cases. So that's what most people think of when they, when they think of the term dementia. Um, although the different types of dementia, they really do present differently. And not only that, as many of you know, many of the individuals that have the same diagnosis will also present very differently. Um, so there's a lot of variability even within a diagnosis. For the most part, individuals tend to be in their mid 70s with the, who are diagnosed with this. Um, if you're younger than 65, we, when, when you have onset of a memory decline um, or of symptoms, we would consider that early onset Alzheimer's disease. Um, but for the most part, individuals are uh, over 65. Now, first symptoms vary person to person, but for the bulk of individuals in which their memory decline or their uh, cognitive decline and their disease process um, is, is due to Alzheimer's disease, you'll have a problem with memory. And specifically encoding and consolidating new memories. Old memories tend to be intact for a long time. So people will come in and say, well, his memory's great. He can remember a lot from his childhood and from when we were in our 20s. And so, you know, I don't really see a problem with memory. And then the questions that gear more towards new memories, are you able to remember recent conversations? Are you repeating questions more frequently um, or forgetting that you've already come to a solution with your spouse on a conversation or a topic? Um, and that's usually a first sign that there's an Alzheimer's disease process, especially if when you try to jog the person's memory and you say, well, remember, we, we talked about X, Y, and Z. And if that doesn't jog the memory, that's more concerning for an Alzheimer's disease ideology. That said, Alzheimer's can present in less typical or atypical ways. So in some people, they may have first symptoms of a spatial deficit. And in day-to-day -day life, it's not as easy to identify a spatial deficit as it is to identify a language deficit, for instance. If there's a problem with language, it's a lot more obvious to the person themselves or to others around them. But if there's a problem with spatial function, it's a little harder to identify. Perhaps they're bumping into a wall, but most people are having that problem. Um, if they are driving, they may be getting lost more, and that's often a first sign of that, um, although some people don't drive that much, and so it's still kind of missed. Um, or they may have some other just vision changes, and when they go to the optometrist, their eyes check out okay, um, and so that can be because there's a problem with the vision system in 
in the brain, not necessarily in the eye itself. Um, and so I put PCA there because posterior cortical atrophy is what we would refer to as like a visual variant of an Alzheimer's disease that starts in the posterior or the back part of the brain. Um, some people will have trouble with word finding as a first symptom. Now that's a tricky one because with normal age related change, we all develop some word finding trouble. Um, and so that's a harder one to, to tell whether it's normal aging or if it's abnormal change that's happening. Um, but in a logopenic primary progressive aphasia, which tends to be due to Alzheimer's pathology ultimately, um, in those individuals, they'll have a lot of trouble with word finding. Um, but there's some other things that in the evaluation, we can also identify to, to see if, if that's what that is. And their word finding trouble is more than expected for age and, and usually interferes with communication um, as that progresses quite a bit. Um, and then there's even problems with identifying numbers and letters and things like that as that progresses. Um, but early on, that wouldn't be, wouldn't be present, wouldn't be obvious. Now, in a frontal variant Alzheimer's disease too, you might have some personality change actually, and you may have changes in decision-making and judgment. So um, sometimes it may be difficult to distinguish a frontotemporal dementia where there's behavioral change from a frontal variant Alzheimer's disease. Um, a lot of people don't know that, that that exists. So I just throw that out there. It's not as common, um, but that can happen too. Now, eventually the impact is more widespread. So as any kind of disease progresses and in Alzheimer's that happens, it typically starts more around the temporal lobe and progresses across other areas of the brain. And as that pathology spreads, you have an impact on different cognitive abilities, different behaviors, even mood and motivation. So those are, are um, those symptoms that you have are, are reflections of the parts of the brain that are becoming affected. And, and as that disease spreads, more parts of the brain become affected. Um, and also they are symptoms of changes in the chemical structure of the brain. And there are chemicals that, that change too, that are not as active um, as they once were. Now the course in Alzheimer's is insidious and in onset with gradual decline. And I put vascular dementia up here too, because it's the second most common type of dementia. Um, although I wanna say it doesn't always progress in the same kind of way with that gradual steady decline and progression, um, the course, which is at the bottom of the slide, but I'll jump there, um, the onset may appear more acute in the case of say a stroke where you have a drop in functioning and as the person rehabilitates, you may have stability or some improvement um, depending on how severe that stroke was and where that stroke was located in the brain. And you may have decline moving forward. It's a little more uh, unpredictable. It depends on the health of the vessels in, in, in a lot of uh, parts. Um, but you may have more of what we call a stepwise decline where moving forward, you have another event and then you, you have a decline in cognition again you're stable for a while, you may have another event of some kind and have another decline. Um, or you may have a gradual, slow, steady decline if there's a gradual buildup of a small vessel disease, um, what we might call microvascular ischemia, where there's ultimately some issue with blood flow in the brain. And so um, it affects um, cognitive function in that way. Now, cognitively, people typically have more of a slowness in processing when there's a vascular cause or a buildup of microvascular ischemia that's more so than age. Um, they may have some executive dysfunction, some difficulty planning ahead so they can remember what medications they take, but they can't plan ahead to get the refill in on time because they can't see forward that far or they're disorganized in their process. And so the problems also often that are affecting their daily living skills are not due to memory necessarily, but more so due to executive dysfunction in vascular cognitive impairment or in vascular dementia. And then there's often trouble with attention and staying focused. And the memory issues are more with inefficient memory, I call it, as opposed to in inability to remember. There's this inefficiency there. I can't pay attention well to get the information in fully but when I do pay attention, I get it in better. 
And then when I'm trying to remember the information later, I, I can't pull it up, but it's in there. I can, somebody can jog my memory and it's in there. So it's this inefficiency in processing in general um, that I see more, more so than anything. Uh, dementia Lewy bodies is the third most common of the dementia cases. And it's usually onset somewhere between age 50 and 80. I'll just point out here that there are two different kinds of Lewy body dementias. One is Parkinson's disease dementia. It's classified as a type of Lewy body dementia. And then there's dementia with Lewy bodies. So that's very confusing, um, but they present differently. They ultimately look kind of similar, um, but they present very differently. In Parkinson's disease, you may not develop a dementia until a decade down the road or more. Um, you may not even develop it. Um, or in a dementia with Lewy bodies, you're going to have early cognitive symptoms as a first sign before you end up having motor symptoms. So with Parkinson's, the motor symptoms are things like uh, having, having uh, trouble move, moving, you may have a rigidity in their movement. You may have a tremor. You may shuffle when you're walking. So there's some stiffness associated with that, um, some postural instability. And then also uh, bradykinesia has to do with just slowness, general slowness in movement. And so in dementia with Lewy bodies, you'll have first cognitive symptoms, and then later you'll develop Parkinsonian symptoms that are more motor in nature. Um, and now we would classify, we would still label dementia with Lewy bodies if you had some motor symptoms first, but within the year you had cognitive issues. Um, and the cognitive symptoms are, are characterized by fluctuations in attention. You may be on and then off and then on and then off. There's more of an up and down quality day to day with cognition. And a, a, a family member will say, well, it's like he's back to normal. And then um, you know, uh, 10 minutes later, he seems confused. You're not able to really focus and get information in. So there's a lot more of an up and down quality in that disease process. Um, and the person also has more awareness usually of the fact that they aren't thinking as clear. Um, whereas in Alzheimer's disease or in frontotemporal dementia, the patient typically doesn't have that awareness. Now they may early, early on in like the mild cognitive impairment phase early on, even, or even before that, they may notice that there's something, but then they lose that awareness. Whereas in dementia with Lewy bodies, they tend to have awareness for quite some time that there's something wrong. Um, they also often have uh, executive dysfunction, spatial perceptual difficulties or slowness in processing. Um, now, visual hallucinations are present in the bulk of individuals. About 80% have visual hallucinations. They may start out as illusions, misperceiving a cord as a snake, misperceiving a bush as an animal, um, and then they develop into more hallucinations, seeing a person, seeing an animal just clearly out of nowhere. Um, and they tend to be able to differentiate whether that's um, real or not at the beginning, but over time, they start to lose that, that awareness and so they begin to have more delusional thinking, believing um, things are there that aren't, or thinking people are after them because they, they uh, just can't trust the, the environment. Um, they often also have dream enactment behavior, which is REM sleep behavior disorder, where they're acting out their dreams. That's sometimes a very early sign. Or uh, delusions, um, thinking that their spouse is someone else, even though they look, they think they're an imposter. You look just like my spouse, but I know it's not you. Um, and some other things. We'll go to the next, the next slide. And then frontotemporal dementia is another very common neurodegenerative disease process where um, that tends to onset earlier. And so if somebody has dementia onset in their 40s or 50s, often that's a sign it's more likely frontotemporal. But I want to point out, this is really important. A lot of people think that if they're 75 or 70 that it's not frontotemporal dementia, but that's not the case. Frontotemporal dementia, while it is more common early, it can present older as well um, in onset. It's just less common. Um, and the most common variant of frontotemporal uh, dementia is a behavioral variant where there's early personality change. Memory seems to be okay initially. Um, but there's this personality change. They may be disinhibited, blurting things out that they wouldn't have 
said before to people or acting a little socially inappropriate, standing too close or not really having the social graces that they did before. Um, they may have reduced empathy. Um, they may have increased temper outbursts or significant anxiety. There's, there's some different ways that can present. The other way that it often presents is with language change. And so these are often what we diagnose early as primary progressive aphasias, where for the first couple of years, there's no problem with memory or spatial skills, but there's language change, getting words out, knowing what words mean, um, and maybe having a hard time with grammatical structure when they are speaking or writing. So those primary progressive aphasias can be due to a frontotemporal dementia process, a frontotemporal um, pathology that's happening in the brain. And then there's also sometimes a motor variant, um, like a progressive supranuclear palsy, caloric basal degeneration. Those are considered atypical Parkinsonian symptoms or syndromes that overlap with the frontotemporal process. Um, and those are also gradual in decline, insidious in onset um, when there's a frontotemporal process or a primary progressive aphasia. So what to look for? Um, I would say we've talked about a lot of different first symptoms and we've talked about those as they pertain to different neurodegenerative diseases, um, memory change, getting lost while driving, changes in speech or language, in judgment or decision-making, personality changes, hallucination, seeing things that aren't there, um, dream enactment behavior where you're acting out your dreams. That's something to watch for if it's new. Um, is there an acute change or an insidious gradual change that helps to think about what might be causing this? Um, either way, well, and also is the patient aware of the changes or not? Um, that also helps to identify what might be going on here. But either way, you need to tell the doctor first because they need to rule out those reversible causes um, with labs and cognitive screening in the office. They need to do brain imaging and then they'll refer you to neurology and or neuropsychology for evaluation. Um, we can talk a lot about prevention, intervention. What can we do to keep things at bay, to slow down progression? Um, and if there is significant functional deficit already, we want to really implement support services and recommendations to help you navigate um, the symptoms that you're experiencing um, with your loved one. So that leads me into um, your, our talk with Kim. She's going to come talk a little bit more about that. What are some support resources that are available? And then we'll talk a little bit about um, brain wellness, what to do to protect your brain moving forward. Thank you, doctor. I appreciate you. Okay, and next we have Kim Saberi. Hi, good day. Um, okay, so uh, first of all, so let me tell you about what I do. I'm in St. Petersburg, Florida in Pinellas County at the Memory Disorders Center. And we are a free outpatient support center for people with cognitive issues and their loved ones. Um, so we can help people anywhere they are on the process. In the process, we can do memory screenings for those people who are wondering, is this normal aging or might something more be going on? Um, we provide um, support resources for what's available to support people who, who have a dementia diagnosis, how, what strategies you can put in place to be as high functioning and as safe as possible. Uh, we have caregiver support groups. We offer, um, you know, educational events and we have um, wellness retreats and social activities for uh, people with cognitive issues and their loved ones. So um, a great resource and we can help anybody. We're a free service. We don't need a referral from a physician. So no matter where people live, we are happy to try to help or point people in the right direction for help. So I know there's a lot of people from a lot of different places on this um, conference. And so what can you do no matter where you live if you are needing local support? Um, you can 
see if there's a local memory disorder clinic in your area. And then also another great idea is to go to the Alzheimer's Association's website, even if you don't know if you have Alzheimer's or if you have another type of dementia, because they came up with their name um, long ago. So they really um, handle Alzheimer's and related dementias. So you can put in your zip code and find your local chapter, like in St. Pete, we're a part of the Florida Gulf Coast chapter. Then one once you get into your chapter, you can find support and support groups that are in your local area. And if you show up at a caregiver support group, they're going to have lots of ideas about what supports and resources that are specific to your area. Um, there's also some really great virtual support groups out there. Um, a Facebook support group, you can just put in the search bar on Facebook what type of dementia you have um, or your loved one has, or if you're dealing with early onset or mild cognitive impairment, and you can find some, some really great groups um, to join there. So now I want to um, talk about brain wellness and what can we do to protect protect our brain. Uh, the first thing that we can do is build cognitive reserve early. So studies have shown that there is no direct relationship between the measurable degree of damage in the brain and the mind's functioning. So the more that we can do to build up our brain and our intelligence and our earlier years, then the more that's going to protect us, even if our brain is having pathology that's showing, um, you know, impairment, uh, that it seems like it should be impaired, but you're not necessarily impaired if you have really good cognitive reserve. So for instance, um, educational attainment. The higher the degree of your level of education, the lower your risk of developing dementia. It's a protective factor. Um, how complex our, our jobs are um, is also a um, protective factor. Engaging in leisure activities of intellectual and a social nature are also very good protective factors. Um, what else we can do to protect our brain is physical exercise. So heart health equals brain health. Anything that's good for your heart is good for your brain. Um, aerobic exercise, which means getting your, your heart rate up, um, brisk walking and other things that get your heart rate up. Um, in memory impaired mice, uh, aerobic exercise was shown to improve learning and memory. Uh, Aerobic exercise stimulates brain-derived neurotrophic factor, um, which is really important for the function of our neurotransmitters. And there's no type of drug that can do this. So it's super important. And for cognitively intact older adults, uh, aerobic exercise protects us from brain tissue loss. It increases blood flow to the brain. Um, it increases prefrontal cortex and temporal lobe brain volume and it improves our executive functioning. Physical activity is good for our brain and our body. It improves cardiovascular status, reduces our risk of heart disease, hypertension, stroke, and diabetes. It also helps us maintain our coordination, agility, and speed, which helps reduce our risk of falling and of osteoporosis. And exercise also risk reduces our risk of depression. Social engagement. Research shows that social engagement is super important for brain wellness. Um, so get busy, stay busy, do what you love. Make sure you have a variety of activities and, and try and do new things. Um, and yes, find things that you love because we all have more fun when we um, and we're more likely to stick to it if we enjoy doing it. Mental engagement is also super important. Um, you know, find something that you like, again, with this as well. If you like crosswords and Sudoku, do them. But um, if you don't, find something else you like and do other stuff too. Because if you continue to do one activity, then you're actually getting better and better at that activity, which means the activity is getting easier and easier. And for mental engagement to protect your brain, you need to be doing activities that are increasing in level of difficulty or the either new. So you're learning new things. Um, there's no one magic memory exercise. 
Um, having good strategies is super important. So uh, pill boxes for your medications, a good calendar system, using assistive technology um, to help you with reminders, whether that's a Alexa or a Siri or setting alarms on your phone. Um, all those things can be really, really helpful. General health, to protect your brain, it's important to have a good um, overall health. Um, sleeping, right, is very important. Protecting your heart, as I said, heart health equals brain health. Follow the American Heart Association's recommendations for, um, for diet and exercise. So um, healthy diet, hydration, lots of fruits and vegetables, and omega-3s such as in fish. And um, American Heart Association recommends 150 minutes a week of uh, aerobic exercise, cardio exercise. And you can break that up however you want. If you want to do 30 minutes five times a week, 50 minutes three times a week, um, that either of those or any, any way you want to break it up is fine. Um, and you want to manage the health conditions that increase your risk of dementia. So the good news is that we have good treatments for things like high blood pressure, heart disease, high cholesterol, diabetes, sleep apnea, obesity, and depression. So unmanaged, those things are increasing your risk for dementia. But if you stay on top of it and make sure you're managing those conditions through lifestyle changes, diet and exercise, medications if needed, um, then it's not your in risk of dementia is not increased. Um, let's see what else. Um, so just a couple more things. So, um, you know, having good habits and routines is super important. Um, if a, a, a hook on the door for your keys, training yourself and training yourself early, because if you get to a point where it's hard to learn new things, if you already have good habits and routines in place, then you can still function at a higher level. So having good systems, having a good calendar system, um, putting, you know, a sign on the back of the door of a list of everything you need to take with you when you leave the house from, do I have my cell phone? Do I have my, um, my Oh, purse, can I do that wallet? every day? <laughs> you do? <laughs> yeah, it's really good. And then the sign will start to blend into the background eventually. So make a new sign, new color paper, um, yeah. put it two inches to the right. Um, if you forget to charge your cell phone at night, you know, put the charger next to your toothbrush and with a note, a post-it note, charge cell right. phone. Uh, so just coming up with creative ways to make sure you're following good routines and habits and that'll help you function well into the future. Yeah. Somebody just said in the chat, you need to take your health into your own hand. That's absolutely right. That's yeah. absolutely right. Um, so on this last slide, you see um, information for how to schedule a free consultation with the social workers at the Memory Disorder Center and also contact information for myself and Dr. Butterfield. And Dr. Butterfield is here in the room with me. So we'd like to open it up to any questions that you have for either of us. Okay, let me see what we have here. So the first one is, how do I find, I don't live in Florida. How do I find a memory disorder clinic near me? So I would go to the Alzheimer's Association's website, which is alz.org, and you can put in your zip code okay. and it'll direct you to your local chapter. The Alzheimer's Association has chapters that cover the entire United States. Um, so reach out to your local chapter or once you go into your local chapter, um, on the Alzheimer's Association's page, you can look at support groups in your local area. And I would start with um, trying to find a support group yeah. um, because they're, even if support groups aren't your thing, you can go once and find, ask people, what are the resources? What are the, what are the right. local supports? Yeah, most definitely. Uh, someone says, what is the typical time frame from when someone shows mild symptoms of Alzheimer's and not recalling Recent conversations, some get, sometimes gets lost when driving, not following instructions for a recipe. So when it gets more progressive, so that they can no longer dress themselves, needs help bathing. So what is the typical time frame they're saying from mild to progressive? Yeah. 
Yeah, so some people, it's really variable, but um, a lot of times people will have some initial symptoms. They may even have mild cognitive impairment and um, have some issues and kind of be stable for two years. You can be at an MCI phase for up to eight years. So you can have these cognitive deficits, there's abnormalities, but you're able to keep up and figure out compensation strategies to keep up. Yeah. Um, so that may be two years, eight years, just in that mild stage. And then you may develop dementia, what we would call dementia, where the Alzheimer's is now affecting the person's ability to manage medications and so forth. And so the, the care partners have to be much more involved and help. Um, from there, it's typically about two to three years in a mild stage, two to three years in the moderate phase where now they're not just needing help with the complex activities, but they're needing now help with reminding them to take a bath, reminding them to maintain their hygiene, things like that. Um, and then usually a year or two in a more severe stage where they need a yeah. lot more, more attention. Okay, next question. This is one of the biggest questions. How do I get them to stop driving? <laughs> oh boy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a tough one. Um, so you can report anonymously, I believe. Right? Yes, to the motor vehicle. That's right. And then a letter will be sent. Um, you may know more about that, Kim. But they, you can anonymously report. So there's this way of going about it. There's also hiding keys, distracting the person from the topic if they are, if they're, if you're able to do that. But um, yeah, what do, what do you think, Kim? Yeah, if you're having a difficult time, you can, their car can break down and go into the shop. We use um, therapeutic fibbing a lot of times when we're trying to get people to stop driving and they're not, they're, they're, they lack awareness of their impairment and they don't think they need to stop driving. Um, you could unplug a spark uh, plug and right. their car breaks down and then it needs to go to the shop and then it just never comes out of the shop. Um, so that's one way. And then again, hiding keys or anonymously reporting through your state's department of motor vehicles. You can put into Google um, report an impaired driver. And this will um, bring up a form you can submit in Florida. I'm sure it's similar in other states. And then yeah. they'll get a letter saying that they need to come into the DMV within a certain amount of time and take a test or else um, their license will be revoked. Um, you can also get your loved one to take a driver's evaluation. Um, in Tampa, for instance, USF, University of South Florida has a driver's evaluation that's done by an occupational therapist. Um, and so you can let a professional um, give recommendations as to whether this person can drive. Yeah, I think not. I think if it comes from a professional from the motor vehicle or from the doctor or from someone who has tested you, it's much easier than the spouse telling them they can't drive. Mm -hmm. But I also have found in some of my support groups, if we have this conversation while we're still pretty cognitive before we get to that and say, uh, you know, someday, mom, you're not going to be able to drive anymore. And I don't want to argue with you about it at the time. So can we like sign a little agreement that says when it gets to this point, it doesn't work for everybody, but it does work for a lot of people. And I, I hope when my time comes, I'm, I'm able to do that smart thing for my family. Yes. And the Alzheimer's Association has a driving contract that you can access on their website or you can email me and I'll send it to you. Okay. And like Linda is saying, this is having the conversation early and getting a person to sign an agreement that says, I agree that if you think I'm impaired, that I will hand over the keys to you. And then if you have to pull out this agreement later and say, look, we talked about this, you signed this and I'm feeling like you're impaired and need to stop driving now. And it may or may not work. And the other thing is just acknowledging the fact that a loss of driving is a huge loss for a yeah. lot of people, a huge loss of autonomy, independence, and, and setting up good alternatives ahead of time. Yes. So transitioning to maybe grocery delivery, prescription delivery, so that less driving is needed. But for a lot of people, going to the grocery store is a big outing and is a, an important part of their day and they enjoy it. Um, so finding alternative transportation options, whether there's a neighbor who can take them to the grocery right. store with them through Pinellas County, you can sign up for, 
um, door to door transportation. You can email me for more information. Um, there's a service called um, through through the bus service, like if a person has a disability such as dementia, and so they can't use the public bus system, um, then they can get door to door transport for $4.50 each way in Pinellas County. Um, there's also Uber and Lyft, and there's a service called Go Go Grandparent. And so for mm -hmm. people who want to use Uber or Lyft, but they're not comfortable using the smartphone and using the app, they can call this um, service and basically the service helps them over the phone and uses the app for them and, you know, charges oh, wow. a surcharge. And that's Go Go Grandparent? Go Go Grandparent. That's very cool. See, I learned something new at every conference. Yes. And in Pinellas County, we also have the Neighborly Care Network and Easy Rider Transportation Services, which you, you know, they're pay services, but you schedule them ahead of time and the drivers are trained to help older adults. So yeah. um, more kind of user friendly than say an Uber or a Lyft might be. And especially when the Uber and the Lyft is always coming in a different vehicle to pick you up. So that can be confusing for people yeah. who are cognitively impaired. But I say, if you are going to try to get your loved one using Uber or Lyft or something, do it with them the first few times, go with them, help them get used to it and do it early, you know, before they need it, even if they're not stopping driving now, but you anticipate that in the future, Take an Uber or Lyft every once in a while. Say traffic is, you know, parking is so hard downtown or at the beach. Let's just take an yeah. Uber or Lyft and get them practicing and, and comfortable using it. Yeah, and lots of times when they see how easy that is, they're like, okay, good, good to go. I don't mind somebody driving me. Right. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for being with us, ladies. What is the last thing you want our caregivers to hear today? You're not alone. There's a lot of support out there. And don't be afraid to reach out and um, and grab some support. Thank you, ladies. Have a delicious day. We'll talk soon. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye.